This is Specific Objects, Talks on Art in the Catskills, and I'm your host, Miriam Atkin. Today, I'm delighted to have with me composer and performer Leah Bertucci. Hello. Leah is a Kingston-based artist, composer, and performer whose work describes relationships between acoustic phenomena and biological resonance. In addition to her long-standing practice with woodwind instruments, her work incorporates multi-channel speaker arrays, radical methods of free improvisation, and creative misuses of audio technology. In recent years, her projects have expanded towards site-specific and site-responsive sonic investigations of architecture and acoustics. Her discography spans over a decade, with eight releases of full-length solo albums and a number of collaborative projects. She has performed extensively across the U.S. and Europe with presenters such as the Museum of Modern Art New York, Gagosian Gallery, The Kitchen, Museo Reina Sofia Madrid, and the Sound of Stockholm Festival, to just name a few. Leah Bertucci, it's great to be talking to you today. Thanks, Miriam. So the first time I heard you play was, I think it was during the height of the pandemic, in the parking lot of TSL in Hudson, and you were in Bobby Previtt's um, ensemble. You were improvising on saxophone, I believe. Right. And then a little later, I saw your... Um, sound installation on Harvey Fites sculpture in Opus 40, which was pretty wildly different than what I had seen you doing with Bobby Previtt. And so I'm just wondering, like, what was the tree that all of these branches originally grew from? Did you start off playing saxophone or other instruments? What what was it? Yeah, um... I would say that I started off as an instrumentalist, for sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm a product of a public school band, and so I played saxophone from the age of nine, um, and I was really into jazz and classical music for, you know, growing up, and uh, eventually when I was in college, I got exposed to more radical forms of um, electronic music. Um, so I started using electronics with my saxophone around that time, um, and then from there, it's just kind of expanded outwards. And I've started to do installations and writing for other instruments and electronics and um, field recording and all sorts of different things. Do you happen to have a specific memory of the first time you heard music that was as abstract and non-melodic in any conventional sense as the work that you make now? And what what that was like and what kind of switch it turned on in you? Yeah, I'm, I would say that the first like weird music that I heard was um, free jazz. Hmm. And that was because uh, when I was in high school, I worked at this uh, vegetarian free jazz cafe that no longer exists, sadly, um, in Rosendale, New York, called the Rosendale Cafe. And at the time, they were having shows of like downtown jazz, free jazz, um, and bluegrass and folk and stuff like that and so you know I was like 16 years old and I saw Joe McPhee play and a bunch of other people doing like radical jazz Mm. um and you know it's I was um I didn't really like it very much at the time because I I mean I was into like I was getting into John Coltrane and stuff like that but it was still like a, a notch above in um like challenging, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So I couldn't quite get with it at the time. But anytime I am not really sure that I like something, I'm kind of interested in in it. It becomes like a point of fascination to me of like, why? Like, what is it about this thing that is like, you know, sticking in my Mm -hmm. mind? And I would definitely say that a lot of the sounds that I encountered through working at the Rosendale Cafe and... Um, yeah, seeing what they were putting on um, stayed with me Hmm. in this way. Um, You know, later when I went to um, Bard, 
I, you know, got more into like electronic noise music and stuff like that. Um, that was kind of prevalent at the time in like the early 2000s. So, yeah, I would say that probably when I was like a teenager was the first time I encountered that music, but it didn't, um, it wasn't like my new, amazing new fascination. Right. I was a little skeptical of it. Yeah. I remember being in my early 20s living in Buffalo and there was this venue that, you know, was known for its program of experimental music, which I was not into. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw a few shows in which, to me, it was just someone behind a laptop, like generating these really quiet, boring sounds. <laughs> And I hated it. And then Tatsuya Nakatani played there one night. And it was like the noisiest thing that I'd ever seen and the wildest thing that I'd ever seen. And I was just totally captivated. Mm -hmm. and, um, Amazing. Yeah. And then later I saw uh, Butch Morris, the Butch Morris Ensemble, which was also like one of the weirdest things I'd ever seen. And seeing people engage with their instruments physically in this way was so fascinating to me. And it, and it, um, sparked that kind of, um, I don't know what you call it, like mirror neuron response or something uh -huh. that made, it was like physically so exciting, but that was, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I didn't end up playing the music. I just continued to appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think for me, because like I played saxophone, I, it was already in the realm of like understanding yeah. of, about like using your instrument, but I didn't really understand that you could use your instrument in this way. Right. You know, I was used to playing little nice melodies and, and stuff like that. I, I was never thinking timbrally, mm -hmm. you know, of like what sounds can I make from this instrument? Because um, that's like not part of the, you know, pedagogy that's not yeah. how you like learn how to do music um so yeah I mean I've also felt frustrated by the like very kind of anemic laptop uh performance I think it just depends on who it is you know I think in in any genre with any process there can be people who do it in like amazing ways and then people who do it in less amazing ways so yeah you know it's just I don't mean to disparage that kind of performance because now I don't, I don't have a prejudice against it like I used to because I have more of an understanding of what might be going on. Right. Um, and how to like listen to that yeah, music. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. I imagine that that discovery that you had, that like your sort of musical explorations could include this. Uh, I don't know, investigation of timbre instead of being hamstrung by the by the melody. Um, I imagine that must have felt really good. Yeah, I mean, it just kind of like expanded my ideas of what's possible. Yeah. Um, like what range of things are possible to express and how to be like creative and inventive hmm. with the music rather than just like replicating historical music. Right. And so when, was that happening mostly while you were at Bard? Yeah, I'd say so. Hmm. Um, and it's funny because also while I was at Bard, I kind of stopped playing music for a couple years. I was a visual, or I was a, a photography major there. So I was more engaged in like visual disciplines. Hmm. Um, and I think it was important to for me to like have that break because... I stopped playing like jazz music. Um, I started listening to like weirder stuff and getting more involved in like radical forms of, you know, just learning about like uh, performance art mm. and video art and like, you know, all sorts of other experimental forms. I want to ask who some of the composers were that were inspiring you then, but I'm also interested in who were some of the non-musical visual artists that somehow like their approach to making work somehow influenced how you ended up making music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, 
I think the one of the big discoveries for me around that time, um, I took a history of experimental cinema class, and <clears throat> I learned about like Stan Brakhage, Maya Darren, Harry Smith, um, experimental cinema people, um, and that really blew my mind. Mm. Um, and that I would say is probably one of the bigger influences on how things kind of turned out for me. Um, I think there's a lot of affinity between experimental music and experimental film um, for like a bunch of different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, you know, both time-based mediums, dealing in like non-narrative kind of forms, um, thinking, you know, texturally, timbrely, um, messing with notions of time, all of these types of things, um, I think, you know, had a big impact on hmm. how I thought of what music could do. Yeah, now that you say that and having listened to your some of your recent work, I'm trying to think about what filmmakers I would name alongside them. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll come up with it by the end of our conversation. <laughs> but I do I do feel that there is there is a, a cinematic dimension to your to your work mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Um yeah, and since we're talking about your history and because um, we're having this conversation during the WGXC Winter Pledge Drive, I want to bring up the fact that you were a Wave Farm resident um, many moons ago, and I just wanted to ask you what that was like. Yeah, so um, I did a residency there. And I might be misremembering the year, but I'm going to say it was like 2009, maybe. Mm. Um, and this was before they had um, built the study center and when it was really just kind of Tom and Galen's property that mm. they um, allowed artists to come and like stay in their cabin for a few weeks at a time. Um, but I had known them a little bit before from Free 103 days back in the city I think we played at their loft like once when it was in South Williamsburg. Mm. And um, yeah, so I mean, they were just, and you know, keep in mind, I was 23 at the time, maybe 24. And so they were really early supporters um, of, you know, what I was doing. And I think it's really important to have people like that who are, you know, allowing um, folks to come up and experiment and just have time and space to work. And they've really done an amazing thing with that organization, building it out the way that they have um, from like pretty humble beginnings. Um, so I think that, you know, continuing to nurture the growth of those types of organizations is like really crucial because, um, you know, it's, it's where young artists um, mm -hmm. and also established artists have like a haven to come and experiment and create. Yeah. And I'm also impressed by the kind of variety of platforms or kind of ways of circulating one's work that Wave Farm and WGXC make possible. I mean, the, the installations on the grounds at Wave Farm and the performances, I mean, the, Galen and Tom collaborate with different um, concert venues around the Hudson Valley and Catskills um, to kind of share programming that is um, that is produced during the residencies. And and then there's like obviously the broadcast element. And yeah, I mean, it's really that that dimension of it is very special and. I've, I've never really encountered anything like it. Um, it's a very special and, and unique place, yes. for sure. There's Yeah, there isn't anything that is quite that up here. So, yep. yeah. If you're just tuning in, this is Specific Objects, Talks on Art in the Catskills. I'm your host, Miriam Atkin, and here in the studio with me is Kingston-based composer Leah Bertucci. Um, I think 
this would be a good time to pivot to the work itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd like to play a couple excerpts from your latest album release, which is called Shadow and Substance. Of um, Shadow and Substance. Which is called Of Shadow and Substance. And it was put out in late 2023 by our label, Cybochrome Editions. The album consists of two long tracks, um, and we'll listen to excerpts from both tracks. Uh, the first track is called Vapors, and it was a piece uh, that was commissioned and performed by Italy's Quartetto Maurice. Yes, and it um, it premiered in 2021 at their festival called uh, Mus Musica in Prossimita um, in the north of Italy. And it's for string quartet and electronics. And this is from the second track, which is the titular track of the album, and it was commissioned by the Philadelphia Creative Foundation Ars Nova Workshop and performed by Henry Frazier, Lester St. Louis, Lucia Stavros, and Matt Evans.
If you're just tuning in, this is Specific Objects, Talks on Art in the Catskills. I'm your host, Miriam Atkin. Um, here in the studio with me is Kingston-based composer Leah Bertucci, and we're discussing her latest album release of Shadow and Substance. Uh, so to start, I'm aware from the liner notes that the album uses just intonation, and this may not be an easy task, but I'm wondering if you can maybe explain what that is in layman's terms. Yeah. Um, so it's actually just the first piece. The string quartet is um, tuned in just intonation. Um, it's basically like an older tuning system that goes back. So like most Western classical or like Western music in general is tuned to what we call equal temperament. And that's something that came around um, kind of like after Bach. And it's, it gives us, you know, like the scale, the chromatic scale, the major scale, um, 12 tone music. It's just like a way of dividing tones. Um, so just intonation is um, an older system that goes back to Pythagoras. So the idea of just intonation is that it's using the natural resonances of like a string, for example. Um, a string, when you pluck it, has different harmonic nodes at which um, it sounds, and those would be the notes of the scale. Um, so when you're tuning in just, it sounds a little bit um, to like a Western ear, um, a little bit more dissonant. Mm. Um, I think it sounds more magical. Um, I think that it sounds more in line with natural processes. Um, it's used by a lot of amazing you know, people over the years, um, Tony Conrad, Lamont Young, um, Catherine Lamb is, um, you know, another example. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's just like a way to get, you know, I figured if I was going to write a string quartet, which is like such a Western classical form, mm. that I should maybe try a different tuning system so it doesn't sound um, too normal, I guess. Mm. Do you see that um, ancientness of just intonation as somehow significant to this piece's particular vision? Definitely. Um, so the the title of the piece is like, um, it has like a double meaning. It's an archaic spelling of the word vapors. So um, in like arcane medical terminology, it's a way to diagnosed so-called hysteria, um, usually in women. And um, a vapor also has, you know, like a fluid mechanics connotation where it's, you know, the moment when a molecule is moving from a liquid to a gaseous state. Um, so it's just like this moment of transition, of instability, of change. So, um, you know, both of those things have long and um, strange histories so, um, yeah, I think that using the just intonation is more than like an aesthetic thing. Um, it also is part of what I was going for in the piece, um, creating a sense of, um, 
eternity of timelessness um of like peering back sort of into history and into human experience yeah when i um when i listen to it um i and and i was listening to it on soundcloud and you have that visualization and so you know you can see that there's this moment about i think two thirds of the way through where um the amplitude just builds into this um i don't know this peak or a mountain or a storm is how yeah, i call it yeah mm -hmm. and it felt it felt like um like the piece was it, it was an event um the piece was about an event that's what it felt to me um mm -hmm. i didn't know what the event was um like i didn't necessarily have an image attached to it but it was an event that had a before and after and the before is very well articulated during the first two thirds of the piece and then there's an after and it feels um that storm is so um kind of like earth shattering that it's almost this moment where when you're in it it, it feels like a yeah like a, apocalyptic mm -hmm. but then there's always this afterward there's this poem by uh john giorno mm -hmm. and it's the the suicide sutra are you familiar oh with yeah that? yeah and it's it's really amazing because it's this long um he he, he uh the the recording of him reading this poem is kind of widely available and that's how i've accessed it was via the recording but it's this long poem that's narrating a suicide and it, it's like you know there's quite a few minutes before the suicide moment happens and then you just assume that it's going to end with the suicide but then it goes on for another you know 10 minutes or something mm -hmm. after the suicide and mm -hmm. there's something that's so both like terrifying and beautiful about that because i'm just thinking about um what i think this piece is meditating on these cycles of life and death and there's always something that's kind of we imagine that we are liberated by these various endings that we might have access to like i can end this life if i don't want it anymore but there's always i mean it's there's something afterwards mm -hmm. and i'm not talking about an afterlife i'm talking about like whatever happens on a molecular level to my to my body when i die but just like um there's something that's very um important to to that like what happens after mm -hmm. and, I, and i really found myself um fully immersed in that in that moment in a very contemplative kind of way um yeah i mean time goes on yeah and actions um there are i, I think this is kind of like a unifying theme between the first two tracks mm. um or the two tracks of the record is that like this idea that actions have resonances that um, extend far into the future mm. so dealing with like time and structure in this way um yeah it's just a, a way of of contemplating that stuff um and i would say i would say definitely like the first track that we listen to um vapors is more on the contemplative mm. side of things in this way um and then the second track is more of like an accumulation hmm. of actions. Um, and that's also facilitated by the electronics um, in the piece. So what the electronics in the second piece, um, the title track of Shadow and Substance, which is a Twilight Zone reference, um, oh, if you which, were wondering. <laughs> is it the name of, a, of an episode? It's um, in Rod Serling's opening monologue at the end. Uh -huh. Or I think, yeah, I think it's at the end. 
um, he has this, he says this phrase of shadow and substance. Oh. And I, I think it's very beautiful and I'm a lifelong um, Twilight Zone fan. Yeah. So that's part of um, <laughs> <laughs> where it came from. But um, so in the second track of, ta- of, um, of Shadow and Substance, um, the ensemble plays for, you know, 20 minutes and um, their sounds are with electronics being discreetly uh, looped and layered uh, over themselves. And so at the end, it's kind of um, this diffused accumulation. And so when the piece is performed live, everybody slowly puts down their instruments and their sounds kind of hang in mm-hmm. the air through like a four channel uh, mm-hmm. sound system. So it kind of speaks to the way that like the accumulation of events over time can leave like a haze hmm. behind it and just like yeah events from the past propelling themselves into the present and into the future so um when the piece is performed are you on stage or the electronics are all being um manipulated by the by the four performers no um i'm the one that is manipulating the electronics the electronics are really simple yeah. um it's just a, a granular synthesis um, patch. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in the second piece, it's the granular synthesis patch plus um, the looping. Um, and that's controlled okay. by me. And I'm either usually um, off like off to the side mm-hmm. on stage or I'll be like in the mixing desk, hmm. um, like in the sound booth. So I'm kind of like... Sometimes on stage, sometimes not. I guess, you know, I can ask this about your work in general, but specifically with regard to these pieces, the kind of sensation or set of images that the pieces do evoke, I mean, which of course will differ from person to person, but however, whatever you see them evoking, Is it something that um, you have in mind and then you build, you craft the piece around it? Or do those things emerge from the the time of performance and then somehow you're able to have a perception of them and then maybe enhance them in post-production or? Yeah, I mean, it's different for everything I do. Um, You know, sometimes I'll set out with an idea and I stick pretty closely to the idea and I execute it. Mm. Usually that's stuff that I've is like in my wheelhouse of things that I've done before and I know will kind of work. Um, you know, these I haven't written that many ensemble pieces. So every time I compose for other instruments, it's really a different thing than when I'm, you know, composing for music that I'm performing myself. Um, for me, the process is like I start out with ideas um pretty abstract ideas of what i want something to sound like um usually it's like based in the sounds of like oh i want to try mm. this technique on the double bass and then this thing happening in the in percussion and like let's see what happens when we make those sounds together um so the process that i use to compose is that i'll work with musicians one on one and i'll have like an array of uh ideas that we kind of like improvise with and Um, record and and play and then I'll take those recordings home and like listen to them and meditate on them and obsess over them for a while and then I'll kind of like craft some you know juxtapositions some layers of things and then I'll go back and rehearse with the ensemble and try out different things and then record that and then see what is the most like what moves me the most and then in the process of you know recording and rehearsing and working with people um, I sort of figure out what the piece is really about. Um, and sometimes it's like revealed to me a little late <laughs> in the process. Yeah. Um, but like with the string quartet, for example, you know, I gave them notes and, you know, pages and pages of notation and, and things. And um, I think we ended up using about three out of like 11 pages that I had written. Hmm. Um, and so it was really a question of peeling away the layers of the onion to see what is the least amount of stuff that I can get the most amount out mm. of. Yeah. Um, and I think that was kind of the right approach for that. Um, it felt like not, not too forced. Right. 
Yeah, um, I wanted to ask you about notation, and I know that you're about to, correct me if I'm wrong, go to Mexico to teach a workshop on graphic notation. Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe talk a little bit about your notation practice and maybe what, what, what kinds of things you're going to delve into um, during the workshop. Yeah, so the workshop is a 10-session uh, master class at MUAC, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Mexico City. Um, and so it's a deep dive into um, different approaches to graphic score or just non-traditional music notation. And I'll be showing a lot of historical examples, and then we'll be doing drawing exercises, and then we'll be playing, we'll have um, people coming up with graphic scores, and then we'll play them. Mm. So, um, yeah, it should be really fun. I think that, um, you know, when you're dealing with non-traditional musical techniques, um, it calls for an expanded form of notation that's off of the staff. I really like the idea that my scores look the way that they sound. Um, and, it, and, you know, this is probably just like part of my like synesthesia or my like practice as a visual artist that drawing is um an important part of like mm. how I express musical ideas and sometimes I use staff notation um sometimes not um it really depends there's also a lot of different types of um approaches to graphic scores um there's like the completely interpretive approach like um uh, Cornelius Cardew's treatise is like, you know, the prime example of this where it's open to complete open interpretation, open instrumentation, and really it, it can sound like anything. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the radical gesture is one of interpretation. Um, for, for my scores, I tend to be a little bit more specific in what sounds I want people to make. But because I incorporate uh, improvisation to some degree it's like controlled improvisation where I'm giving people like a set of musical techniques to play with and then mm -hmm. I want them to play with each other basically um, so trying to create spaces where people are not like having to fastidiously read the score um, and are able to like open themselves up to actually like listening to what's going on within the ensemble while the music is happening um, that's kind of like what I'm more interested in is it like a suggestive form of notation hmm. if you're just tuning in this is specific objects talks on art in the cat skills i'm your host miriam atkin and here in the studio with me is kingston-based composer leah bertucci so in the last few minutes of our conversation i i'd love to give the audience a glimpse of the kind of range of work that you do and you have an album that's um, not yet released called I Know the Number of the Sand and the Measure of the Sea. Um, it's very different from the tracks that we just heard and so I would love to play a clip from that. The album is a collaboration with Olivia Block. <clears throat> That's right. And it'll be out on a label called Room 40 Shoots um, this year. And um, so this this record is um, Olivia is playing synthesizer and field recordings and tapes. And I'm playing um, I'm doing voice with tape and other electronics. So um, I found this funny process of um, altering my voice electronically through the use of reel-to-reel -reel tape. So um, it's kind of like extending, warping, and twisting my voice. Um, and it's a really easy way to improvise. Hmm. Yeah, let's take a listen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
The first thing that struck me when I heard this album is that you have this background in wind instruments, and now you've um, innovated this kind of instrument that has, or it's it's a kind of it's a kind of music that's grounded in the movement of the breath. Mm -hmm. And I've always found wind instruments to be vulnerable in a certain way in a kind of unique way and that you know the 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 force of the sound is really dependent on the operation of the body and the internal organs in this way that almost becomes very visible in performance mm -hmm. and it, especially hearing you describe your role um in the other tracks that we just listened to, you're, the way that you're manipulating the electronics sort of um, off the side of the stage. So I'm, I'm just thinking about this movement between um, being almost this like invisible Wizard of Oz director figure to being to having your your body and vocal cords and breath center stage. Yeah, I mean... I my background is as a performer mm -hmm. and as an instrumentalist and a wind player, right? So I've always been pretty attuned to the fact that like my actual life force, like the thing that's keeping me alive is what is creating like a musical thing, right? And I always found that mm -hmm. really fascinating with playing saxophone and playing w wind instruments. Um, the voice, it's really interesting, like um, transitioning to doing things with my voice, I, I always had a lot of kind of baggage around my voice. And um, so it wasn't easy to, you know, start doing that. Mm -hmm. I think that it's actually been like a really liberating thing for me to, to use my voice. And thinking about, you know, the intimacy of that is, is something that's actually really powerful. And, you know, if I am being a performer, I might as well really be a performer and be present and have my body be like very much incorporated into what I'm doing. And so I think using voice even more so maybe somehow is, um, is doing that. Mm. Um, I think, you know, and this gets back to just having like a diverse kind of practice. Um, it's really nice to sometimes have other people be the performers yeah you know um and it comes with its own set of anxieties um because you know I don't have as much control over what happens in the performance mm -hmm. but it also has its own form of liberation where I can just kind of like stand back and you know put trust in other people that they're going to like do what needs to be done so I mean it's just you know being a musician there's so many different parts of it, right? There's like the studio practice where I'm alone in my space and I'm listening to stuff and I'm making things by myself. Then there's like the collaboration where I'm like touring with people or collaborating um, in like groups and then, you know, recording versus playing live. And, you know, there's just like so many parts of the practice that mm. you can get into. And so to me, um, not being on stage 
is just another way in which like music is a really diverse kind of discipline. So to to wrap up, um, I guess I want to just ask you what you have coming up. Are there any upcoming projects or performances you want to mention? I guess, you know, the next thing that I'm doing is the Mexico City thing. Um, I'll be performing there at Casa del Lago um, on the 20th. So if anyone in the Hudson Valley is going to be in Mexico <laughs> City in the next couple of weeks, come hang out. Um, uh, and then the record with Olivia will be out later um, uh, in the summer. And yeah, I don't know. That's kind of, That's kind of what's going on. Well... Thanks for talking with me. It's been a real delight. <laughs> Thanks, Miriam. Thank you.